start with, you should take note that to be, to try and pursue being a real neural subversive, a real revolutionist, there's only one profitable and useful study of man, and that is as a species and not as an individual, which is just, as always, almost the opposite of what the contemporary <laughs> enlightened intellectual view would be. Now, I'm not talking about the academic world of saying we're studying man in an anthropological or a biological. Now, I'm talking about down at the level that we're no longer dealing with the somatic side of man that we're dealing with that which ordinary intelligence believes is the psyche, the soul, the spirit, and blah, blah, blah. At that level, all the way from religions to metaphysics to psychiatry to sociology to psychology, although they might give some lip service to the study of, especially sociology, to group behavior, it is still on the basis that the proper study of man is the individual, and there's a reason for that. But I was going to try and get you to see several different ways tonight, some variations. That, that is just a waste of time. <laughs> it is not useful. It is only ordinary intelligence that believes that the knock on their door regarding their personal life is of any consequence. But now you people on tape, if I have to do this, which evidently I do, this is not an attack on humanity. This is not a social criticism. If you think any of this is talking about real ordinary life, you're wrong, all right? And it has nothing to do with people's ego and their personality and all that, because if that is your problem, you're in the wrong place anyway. But notice that even if people did not, if an individual did not uh, insist that they were involved or interested in some sort of extraordinary study and attempting to gain some unusual insight into the nature of man, even if they didn't say that, if you just stood around and had cocktail conversation with them, you, you should be able to hear this because for nothing else to listen to your own nervous system talk. The importance of life to a civilized intellectual person is the individual. What do most people think about the ordinary level? No, not me, themselves. That's what they think about. And if you engage them along certain lines of inquiry, you would see if you needed any other proof that if there is anything to be learned about man, if there's anything worthwhile to be investigated, it has got to be on a one-by-one -one basis because we're all little God's children, or if you're an atheist, we're all somebody's children. The individual is sacrosanct politically, economically, sociologically, to attempt a kind of neo neural renaissance, there is no profit in such an attempted study. You have got to look upon man in the sense of it being him being a species. You have got to look upon human life in a sense, as far as possible, of it being a universal phenomenon. You cannot look at it under local conditions, that is, if you only respond to the door, if you continue to respond to the knock on the door of what seems to be energy flowing in and out of your nervous system through life, the knocks are continually involved with you responding, and the first thing you want to do after you say hello is you want to tell whoever it was what kind of guy you are. And that passes as the study of man. And it passes quite well. It passes with a certain kind of respect in ordinary affairs under the name, the description of being introspective, of being reflective. <laughs> that even some ordinary intelligence might say that it would be, perhaps, of some benefit to study man as a species when, when I get through knowing about me that they might admit, if they heard me say this, that theoretically I can give some credence to what you say and perhaps I will pursue it, but right now what I must do is I got my hands full with me. <laughs> that is the way it's supposed to be. I once heard, if you can find the connection, 
It was a native-born Parisian that I think was living in this country, and something was brought up about using French terms and words, saint fron And this guy being sort of bicultural and interested in linguistics, evidently, he pointed out, he said, all right, Americans or any foreigner, you should not try and actually worry about the French pronunciation of French words if you're going to throw them into your vocabulary. Because for one thing, a Frenchman will immediately spot you as an interloper. He'll you'll never get it right. So he'll immediately spot you as a foreigner, one. And number two is, other Americans won't know the difference anyway. <laughs> In the area I'm describing now, there is a certain kind, if you can follow it, of striking similarity. That even if you could give a good shot at the study of man the individual, if you could, it would be to no avail. You didn't follow the connection there. You can't win. You might as well, according to my fictitious little Gaelic spokesman, it doesn't, don't even try because those who know how, that is, the French will recognize you as being incorrect and being a foreigner, not knowing what you're doing, being in the wrong place. But those at the place where you are in the same locale, that is, you studying you, they're not going to know the difference anyway. You can pronounce faux pas, go ahead and pronounce it fox pass like God intended. And somebody else from Alabama along with you, they might look at you and say, what's well, a French term? And so they don't know. <laughs> if you attempted, if you spent great effort, if this was possible, directly attempting an inquiry, an investigation of man, the individual, not the species, and in some way, I'll just have to put in quotation marks, you gave it a good shot. You spent your life doing that, and you gave it, by God, the good old college try, the point is, it doesn't matter. Those that might be native to what you're looking for are going to recognize that you didn't do it right, and those that are going to be there and might agree with you, that might go ahead when you said Fox Pass and not alone, see, they don't know whether you did it right or not. Can you see that all of that can take place within your own brain? that you're trying to study you. To what avail? For other times you try to study you, all of you have been through this long before you got involved here with me, attempting to reflect upon yourself and to figure out what kind of guy you are. <laughs> if you figure out at times what kind of guy you are, I notice that I'm sticking with my made up example of the French language since it had such a egregious bombing if you're talking to yourself and you say, well, this has been worthwhile because now I understand so-and-so about me, whatever it is, I now begin to recognize that I do have a certain amount, I'll make up one, a certain amount of, I believe, aggression toward the opposite sex. And I've been aware of that now for about seven or eight years. But now, in the last three or four years after that, I believe now I'm beginning to realize that I have a certain kind of, oh, a certain amount of ill will, I believe, toward my poor late mother. And I'll bet you it's connected. All right, so that took seven or eight, or 12 years. Let's assume that's true, and you tell yourself this. You knock on the door, and you say, yes. You say, that's what I believe. I'm beginning to think that. And you go, your brother-in-law goes, my, my. How interesting. What if he even goes, ah, me thinketh me smell some validity. Well, you burnt the bacon. What if that is true? What if that happens? What I'm telling you now on that basis, those who might know better, that is the actual native French, hearing you slaughter their tongue, there's no way you can hide it. They know that you are misstepping. They know that you are a fraud. They know that you are a foreigner. They know that you do not belong there. I remember where I was, you telling you that, well, yes, I've been studying me and I've come up with such and such. You either got that possibility, or the other possibility is that you do go, well, all right. It is an, uh, another guy from Alabama hearing you attempt to speak with that kind of 
to actually use the French language as a French would. Another native here is not going to know whether you pronounce the words correctly or not. So the point is, it doesn't matter. It is to no avail. I would suggest, without getting philosophical, if you just consider just a dictionary, for those of you that still got any memory of taking philosophy 101, I guess. But the terms objective and subjective, it gets into a real, if I could push you a little further, those of you that didn't even step off the path yet, a kind of revolutionary operations of those two words in the real sense, in the basic sense of the words, of whether you're intellectually going to be scrutinizing the goods and services, scrutinizing, trying to study the object, in this case, of man the species, or whatever it was, the objective, that you are, the study is involved with the object at hand, whatever it is. In this case, is man the species. Whether it's either that or subjective, that you're apparently making an inquiry into what the subject, that is me, what I think of what's going on. But on the surface, that will pass as being admirable heights of intellectual activity. Do you follow? There are certain views, and I could support them, that the latter, the subjective, is the true highest mark of the human spirit. Because who the hell cares about mathematics or a, a, a tree? I mean, no offense to trees, but to look at a tree, a tree is just a tree. But what makes the human individual precious, if not precocious, is I don't have to just write about a tree or think about a tree. I can think about what I think about a tree, which of course normally is something kind of heart-wrenching. I look at a tree and I notice the leaves are falling and it reminds me of death and I get the blues. God, I wish I'd learned to read and write. I could become a romantic poet. Or maybe I could tell everybody that I'm browning reincarnated and I lost my memory. I can't, you know, I'm now illiterate. It passes. It always has for very good reason that you should be able to smell yourself. That the subjective can be seen and defended as being the highest achievement. It's normally called the human spirit, but it's the human intellect. So you've got these two basic approaches of the intellect that you attempt to study something objectively. That is, your interest is in whatever it is. In this case I was using would be man the species. Could be anything. The other possible approach is the truly subjective, that the primary area of interest is not in whatever is being studied. If it wasn't man, it could be art, music, automotive mechanics, that the interest is not in the object now, the interest is in the subject, me, the individual. What I think about it, sometimes called what I feel about it and blah, 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 is why they call it the human spirit. But all they're saying is that the interest is not primarily in what the object is, it's in what I think about the object. So you've got these two historic continuing possibilities. And I would like to point out to you that one of them's a waste of time from a certain view. Just, I decided enough beating around the old tree. Put it to you another way. The firstborn self of a neural subversive is of no particular interest or use. Oh, maybe, I don't know, two or three minutes or eight or ten years of that kind of study about your firstborn self, that is, you the individual. I'll grant you that. It's kind of a passing hobby, if that's what it takes. But beyond that, you would have to consider, I suggest, that something may be amiss with the way you're going about this if you still find, I'll go ahead and be even more blunt, if you still find you of any particular interest, you're stealing time 
from this. You're wasting time. You're answering the same door over and over and over and over. There is simply nothing of any particular interest once you are able to crank up a new area of your own brain, a new kind of building site, a kind of new intelligence. The only study of you is almost just a glance as you're studying man the species, which you may be able to take in at one sitting, for all I know. It's not impossible. And to study man the species includes you and every other mother's son of you. Good, bad, ugly, and indifferent. But there is a reason of feeling this kind of individuality, and there is a reason that even at the intellectual level, humanity, not dumb people, not uncivilized people, but the very front ranks of ordinary humanity have always had this feeling that the study of oneself, you know, the great rising from the Greek philosophical legends, you remember, by Socrates, I believe that Plato was playing the kind of games I play with Cairo, that Plato is quoting Socrates, who Socrates was supposed to be quoting somebody else, which, you know, you can always move yourself way away from it and say, well, yeah. I'm just telling a story, but about, you remember, the soothsayer whose sooth that she said was know thyself. See, it didn't say no humanity. It didn't say no large groups of folks. It didn't say <laughs> no everybody in Athens is a group. Know thyself. People remember that. Somebody somewhere. That oracle probably had a sister-in-law somewhere that probably one time was trying to cash in on the business or make a name for herself, you knowing how sibling rivalry goes. And she probably had a sister-in-law that sometimes says, no, the life, the only life worth living or a life ill-spent is a life that was not spent trying to know everybody. But notice nobody remembered that. Everybody remembers, though, know thyself. And thyself, they know exactly what they're saying. What they're saying is, me. Forget thyself. A kind of <laughs> archaic language makes, makes simple ideas sound a little more philosophical and weighty with some people. But it's saying the study of me, the study of the individual, is the proper study. But from a revolutionary view, from a kind of neuroradical approach of doing something extraordinary in your lifetime beyond the first intellectual birth, there is no profit. The only useful study of man is as a species. Now, I was going to draw up a chart, a diagram, and it is an expansion on things I've talked about, but plus it is a kind of narrowing of it, which, you know, it's only an activity like this that you can have it both ways, because it is. Plus, I got real big holes I'm going to leave in it and gaps. I was going to draw it. It's going to be a large rectangle. But even as I said that, maybe I'll do it in different strokes to where even the rectangle is not completely closed up. You would understand the allegorical significance of that. You would? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's... I want it big enough that I could write a little bit on. Those of you who have been around here a little bit, know that I have divided up not just man the individual, but I've divided humanity at times and referred to it pictorially as serving purposes of life as an assembly line or as a corporation. Consider this is the labor spectrum. And to even narrow it down and to make it more vague, I was going to, since we've got to call the three areas something, Picture it as a good old two-dimensional map of the United States, just for instance. I could use other stuff. And to pick out terms that are less likely that you can have any useful ordinary thinking about. Uh, let's call this one over here like time zones in general areas, ge geographically speaking, of this, the United States. Let's call this one the eastern zone, just the Pacific zone, and call that the plains, the great heartland of America. Just the farm belt running down from the Dakotas and through Nebraska and Kansas and the Midwest. So let's consider it that way. But it's a labor spectrum.
And I want to give you some general ideas about what's going on in here. Now, well, let me give you two or three or four facts. I can do that since I made up the whole labor spectrum. So whatever I say is a fact, is a fact. Everybody individually is working at any given time in one of the labor zones. People are continually shifting from one zone to the other, and they can do it faster. All right, for those of you who won't be technical at this level, as fast as the speed of light, which is certainly faster than human thought, but it is as fast as you can be aware of. An individual can also be working in more than one of the zones, which amounts to a kind of part-time work, but it's possible. You can simultaneously, at a three-dimensional level, you could be doing some labor in two zones at one time. And I want you to also remember, as I get a little more specific, that all three of these zones, which I'm going to differentiate through suggestion and hint, that even though the three zones are furnishing a kind of labor pool that is distinguishable one from the other, that in spite of all that, all three of the zones are always to life furnishing food, fuel, and a means of energy exchange. And as I may try and point out a little more specifically, there's always this possibility, even a kind of more basic level than I just described, that is, that all zones are furnishing food and energy and a medium of energy exchange. Even beyond that, in all zones, at all times, you can always simply be dog food. I won't leave it at that. <laughs> Consider, let's start on the Pacific zone. What you've got, this labor pool, this zone, is you've got the individuals at any particular time they're there are very intellectually active. It is a form of where life is doing research and development. The people, the individuals involved with it, are... They're itchy, they are anxious, in general, as opposed to the other zones, as you might surmise, the general thrust of this zone of labor, this division, is in the, in the key word, is intellectual improvement of life as lived and witnessed by man. Let's take the plains, the mid area. What you've got amounts to a kind of intellectual mid-range. It's It's sometimes on with the people involved, and it's sometimes off. In the plains, in this mid zone, is where you have, that means secondary, the secondary achievers, sometimes known social climbers, trying to, ch it is the area wherein there's the most general activity and struggle to move from one zone to another. It is also the area that could be referred to, I might as well, as
the intellectually nouveau riche. Now, for you people on tape, this has nothing to do with social criticism. There's no attack on yuppies or anybody else. Let's go to the eastern zone. I'm not leaving all these yet, but I'm going to set the basis for some of this. You have, let's start off intellectually, what you have in this area is the individuals involved, you could almost say that they're intellectually flaccid. Or it can even appear to be that they are intellectually indifferent. And whereas over here, let me make it sub, over here, you have liberals in every sense of the word, even the common use of the word politically throughout the world, but it's much more than that. Over here you have, in regard to them relatively being a kind of intellectual, it's not necessarily impotent, is why I said flaccid. Instead of uh, impotent, disinterested. And as opposed to the Pacific zone, you find people are, of course, as you might guess, more conservative. Grumpy about their conservatism. They are chemically and food-wise more involved, you would say, compared to the intellectual improvement to just the I repeat again, though, all three of these areas no matter if you looked at them, which you, for your own purposes, could, that over here you would have people that their primary purpose, if you're in that area, in that zone working, is for the intellectual betterment of life. Whereas at the other end, you'd be closer to just down to the plain dog food level, just <coughs> serving, furnishing grunt energy for life. But they're not that far removed because all three areas are still a medium of energy and grunt energy. Basic energy is just as important for the sake of life as a whole as the intellectual is. That shouldn't sound strange. Let us say that you are, from all ordinary views, a fully functioning intellectual creature. You work in some intellectual field, you teach at college, or you're in programming. You do know that you have to stay relatively healthy from here down, or you can't even get to work. You know that you've got to eat a certain amount. You've got to eat something resembling a so-called balanced diet somewhere once a week or once a month, or else your brain begins to wander. Your neural cells begin to sneeze and water up. It is all necessary energy going into life. The mid-range, the plains area, one thing I did not write down in the chart, and so far as the Pacific zone, that end of the spectrum, being anxious to change, always thinking, always willing and itchy to find something new, but primarily here now, not just to find something new of a new fad and clothes or some new exercise. Not that they would be completely immune from it, remember, because you can be operating in more than one zone at a time. But the thrust of it, for me to describe it, the thrust of their activity in this zone is the intellectual improvement. In the Plains zone, what you have, as opposed to simply the attempt describable of this area pushing for intellectual growth, and down here, they're more in charge of simply the physical growth of life. 
in the mid area, you could describe their function vis-a-vis -vis those two as being a continual form of self-adjustment. It is life maintaining its present weight, its pleasant health. Can you see that from any particular view, one zone will find itself quite reasonably, quite predictably, to be in conflict with an adjoining zone or both other zones? You have the historic conflicts that I have mentioned surely enough, if it doesn't jog your memory, politically, socially, between the so-called progressives and the conservatives. It has always gone on, and it goes on in you. But it is a labor pool that stretches from a spectrum of a wide violet shift all the way to a red end, all the way from a left to a right, all the way from a Pacific to an Eastern. And within that are activities, endeavors, jobs going on from all the way from east to west that keeps the whole country running. There are activities going on at the individual level of them churning up and changing their own brain chemistry, churning up energy to keep the total organism of life going. But from any individual level, each zone can very easily, very rationally see itself being in direct conflict with the other zones. Thus, this one is always ready to experiment, always want to do something new. The other end, the other extreme, is almost indifference to the point of not even arguing about it. And if you reach that point of indifference, arguing is superfluous anyway. If we're dealing with a kind of archetypical intellectual couch potato down here, living dog food, it's not going to argue back. It doesn't have to argue back. If you cannot make it move, but that which is more interested, where the most activity would seem to be trying to move from one to the other, is where the illusion, I know it's a real illusion now, but where the concept of the middle class came in. And if some of you recall some time back, I pointed out that there was really no such thing as the middle class, not just sociologically and economically, it was a kind of buffer that life ran between the king and the peons, your best part and your lowest part. And the middle class is a kind of, look over here. Now watch my hand, and I'm going to make it to where if you work real hard for, oh, 65 years, just before you die, you may be down to the point of paying off some of the actual principal on your home loan. <laughs> Don't you feel much better because you're... It seems to be a form of progress. It is where it would seem to be the most... Now we're talking about now down to the ordinary earth level. Secondary affairs now, not primary, but secondary affairs. This seems to be where the most activity is going on that people are achieving something. People are, in fact, paying off last year's, finally paying off last year's master charge. Whew. So that now, and they took away your card, but now you can get on with this Visa card that you've had in abeyance all this time and you didn't use it. It seems to be some kind of progress, but it's always in secondary affairs. It can seem to be an improvement in your social position, the amount of money you have saved, a better house, a better car, which is fine. It is needed in life. But it is not feeding directly intellectual interest, but is it, it is no longer feeding what would it be if you can begin to follow me now with no offense to our canine buddies. But down at the other end, dog food. <coughs> that that's about all you're serving for life. In the middle is the illusion that I'm going somewhere. It's a, I say an illusion, it's a secondary affair, and it's not really an illusion, not in the ordinary sense of the word but it is a changing positions in the death queue. It is a dancing around on the same dance floor, and you believe that, well, I got a new partner. Well, maybe I don't have a new partner, but I look better, and if I keep looking better, I'll finally look so much better that I'll be able to drop this partner and get a new one. 
All right, it's the belief that, well, yeah, I kind of recognize that, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll answer the door a little differently. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go to the door and I'll answer it in French. <laughs> it's all of these secondary affairs that give the sensation that I could move up in the world. That's the way it appears socially, is why I was using that kind of running parallel with the middle class. But it is the impression that chemically, in my brain, in my total being, as a matter of fact, there, but they think that it's in my brain, I'm improving myself. No matter where you are, no matter which zone that you find yourself toiling in, you got to remember this, that everybody is serving life. And it is only a revolutionary, worthwhile question, and it's not the kind of question, of course, to be discussed, for anybody to be concerned over, well, is one serving life better than the other? All of you should be good enough by now to take the kinds of myths and legends and diagrams I can sketch out and to see that you can certainly take a position and say, well, it would be better to be over here working in the zone that is most involved with pushing life's intellectual frontiers. That that's what I would prefer to do, or you might try and get philosophical or theoretical and say, well, that's surely where we should more of us be, if not all of us. But you can't do that. If you look at this as being a whole organism, you can't desert the dog food side, the grunt energy production, unless you're going to believe these kind of science fiction B-movies that suddenly next week or next generation we're all going to become just brains sitting up on some kind of little podium. <laughs> and as all the great religious people that never could get any sex used to always believe that it's the body holding us back. It's this old damn carnal cheap flesh. If it wasn't for that, I'd be soaring with the angels and living with the gods. You'd be dead, that's for sure. You know. After that, you can believe whatever you want to. It is as important, we'll assume, that you understand this, that right now, even if you were still wired up to think, well, boy, my body is a drag. It sags on me, and it's <laughs> sick, and it limps, and it tends to get spotchy on its elbows, or whatever it is, that you fall into being this kind of subjective approach person, even if you're not poetic, that have historically cursed to varying intensities the body. Some of the more romantic ones of the past thought, well, the body should be in some way done away with, subdued for the sake, they used to call it the spirit. But you people should be well enough to see it now. What they're talking about is the division, even though I call it arbitrary and capricious that I make, life does it too. There's no reason I repeat it. That they, they're really talking about the brain, the intellect. That God, if I could just sit around and sometimes I can have such great thoughts. If I've had about you know 17 cups of real strong coffee, and uh, I don't know, and the moon's just right. Sometimes I can have thoughts that, Phew! and then suddenly I realize I gotta go to the bathroom again. I, I keep going to the bathroom, and uh, my kidneys hurt. Plus, my back's beginning to ache, and am I getting old? And getting, and you think, boy, if it wasn't for my body, if that didn't wasn't always hounding at me and kind of lurking over my shoulder, if I was none but pure intellect, ah. Uh, if you were pure intellect, you'd be dead. <laughs> so the point is, we are still, all of humanity, from a larger view, if you get outside of this subjective view, if you begin to look at man as a species, you cannot do without the grunt energy. You can't do without it. Life cannot do without it. Man, the species, cannot do without it. Man cannot also do without the middle class, the boobsies, the George Babbitts of the world, the bourgeoisie, not just the real dog food people of the world, not just the bricklayers and the illiterate ditch diggers and all that. Not that. It cannot do without these either that are most abused from one view. That's not the point. I'm not taking up for them. But they are, the, in a sense, the most abused even in you. Look how much of what you have been driven to do, the doors that you want to answer in your life, and you would turn right around and attack yourself. That's the basis of it springing up in religions and in social psychology that we should not be too vain, too self-centered. 
which is just another impossibility, give you something else, another hobby, because it is a form of self-fueling energy that appears to be sociological or intellectual attacks on oneself of thinking, well, I believe I'm too, I think I'm better than I actually am. Every now and then I catch on that I go back to school not to learn anything. I only go back to school. All I want to do is I want to finally get through and become a lawyer or a doctor just so I can go back. I'll wait eight or ten years and I'll finally go back to one of my school reunions and then I'll go in and I'll be wearing my stethoscope just accidentally <laughs> around my tux. Or I'll just casually be bringing in some law books under my arm it is not just one group attacking another. Humanity attacks itself on who do I think I am. <laughs> and it's normally on, the, on, on some kind of basis that you're failing at it, that you tried to go out and move in a better circle. And just when things were going, you thought fairly good. You said something about a fox pass, and everybody around you went, and they started like this, and somebody perhaps came and told you or handed you a dictionary, and you looked, and you went, uh-oh. That's when people do things like, well, who do I think I am? A man should know his place. I'm trying to be better than my own breeding and my own background. But this is still the area, whether it appears that you're getting anywhere with it or not, or whether you appear to be an abject failure at it. This is where the most activity seems to be which even in ordinary terms, sociology and social critics would agree that that's what the middle class is. It is kind of the cauldron where you can go from being a nobody if you're not in some real class structured society, that you can go from being a nobody to being a somebody. But that area, besides it appearing to be very active and being more fluid than the other two, is really compared to the other two, in charge of a kind of self-regulation of life. It is that kind of feedback that is known in systems, it is known, in, of course, in software, but it's known in the human organism that there is a kind of feedback necessary for you to keep your balance, for the temperature of your body to stay right. But humanity serves a purpose, specifically in this zone, that it is a self-adjusting it is between that and this. And this apparently takes sides. It apparently can be running, if you want to jump back to my geographical example. If this was a Kansas, and there you are in the middle of a field, that it can apparently run over here on one side and join up with the Eastern conservatives, the indifference, the intellectually flaccid, just don't even bother me. I don't want to hear about it. But then can think, ah, I'd hear something, some noise going over there, some new fad some new health food, real or allegorically, going on on the Pacific coast, and you can run right over, and you're suddenly out of Kansas, you're over the Rockies, and you're right out there with the people that's happening. But do you understand that there in the middle is a kind of adjustment, although it seems to be, as I'm saying, if you can see it, would seem to be the area of the most possible movement in all kinds of ways, all the way from quite materially speaking at the three-dimensional level to quite tropically, metaphorically. And yet it is serving a purpose of a kind of self-adjustment. Because if you had a machine, if you had a piece of armament or something, and it had to continually, which all things do, whether you ever thought about it or not, but they've got to continually adjust themselves. Let's say that you've got this huge intellectual overweight rocket and it's got to keep itself on course for 70 years. And so it's got this, let's just call it the self-adjusting, the homeostat. But it's one little piece of machinery in there. What's going to be the most active thing in that rocket? Now, if it finally hits, you can say the warhead's going to be real active. I mean, it's going to give a whole new definition to being active. And you can say that parts of it, just the inert, as far as that goes, the inert shell of the rocket could be the eastern part. And so... The adjustment part, that that seems to be all it's in charge of, the adjustment part can be the most active because it has constantly got to keep a kind of balance. It's got to constantly be the place where the thing stabilizes itself. 
and it would appear to be at the other ends is where things are most radical. Either in the sense that nothing's going on, or over here, everything's trying to go on at once. Notice something else. The closer the individual is to toiling in the eastern zone, then the more the individual is going to find, or the more that you would see it, is you're going to find that the people tend to operate as a group, uh, such as uh, areas of the world still goes on now. You can have uh, dignitaries show up. You can see a film and... Uh, the president of Italy flies into some country that's pretty well down in the eastern zone. And large groups of people come out to meet this dignitary. And you can't even spot the king of this tribe. What you've got is hundreds or thousands of people, and they come out dancing, shaking spears, shaking their fist, And it's like the whole group, or if they're out demonstrating, Whatever they're doing, the closer you are to operating in the eastern zone, the more individuals move, that is, operate, physically and otherwise, but the more they operate as a group. And you don't have to live in some less civilized area of this planet right now to know that. You should know it in you. It's sometimes referred to as a herd instinct, which doesn't tell you much. But that's what they're basing that on. When you move in the other direction in this spectrum to the Pacific zone, you have then the individual operating more as an isolated phenomenon. That is, that the individual people operating more on the basis of being an individual. You end up, for instance, with the Eastern zone people, that the individual tends to move and think and live and operate more as a group. Uh, I'll give you an easy example. And it's not only out there, of course, it's in you. The love of sports. And move to the other end, in the Pacific zone, where the individual is tending to act individually you would have then the love of literature. You have at the Pacific Zone people who would become, in the ordinary run of affairs, become writers, inventors, philosophers, all forms of academia. And at the other end, you would have all forms of sport activities, all forms of the building trades, all forms of grunt labor, and the people involved, which include some part of you and your own nervous system, the people involved, their feeling of themselves is tied more to the tribe, to a group, that they feel less of an individual than they do as part of a herd, of a pack. Now, this is no sociological comment. What it has to do is the way you operate inside of your own nervous system, because at the more conservative end, a knock at the door and you want to be with a group that everybody hears the same knock and that there seems to be voices arise in you somewhere that tells the knock, go away. Or maybe it's a tentative, go away. And everybody in your tribe, you're all staying there, you and all of your nervous system, you're all staying shoulder to shoulder, and you may be a tentative, uh, who is it? And everybody else goes, yeah, who is it? Who is it? And yeah, you go, yeah, yeah, who is it? Yeah, yeah. Or maybe another time you go, go away. And they'll go, We'll find out who it is. Well, yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, who is it? Who is it? <laughs> the feeling of being alive is tied more to a group activity of you feeling yourself as a group with your family or it begins to expand to some particular race, to some religion, to some culture. It doesn't matter. But it's a dog food level. It's a basic level. It is a grunt energy level that is necessary in you, it is necessary in humanity, but notice, there's no way out of it once you see it. 
The feeling of individuality is absolutely submerged. Your feeling of being alive, your feeling of how you think is more in line with a group. And at the other end of serving life as an intellectual active participant, it is more a feeling of me truly as an individual. And I said isolated once, I want to say it again, and I do not mean that in some psychologically negative term as it's used nowadays. But it's simply that what you think, what you're doing in this area, is you're doing it. You don't need somebody to support it. You may change your mind. You may not change your mind, any possibility. But you do not need the thing of turning around and like, hey, did you hear what I just thought? What do you think, guys? And you don't need somebody to go, here, here. Now, all of that, outside of what would appear to be really material, psychological terms, you do understand I'm talking about inside of your own nervous system. Considering your own brain, if you're going to be a neural subversive, are you going to hang around and follow and answer and heed the knocks that are common to the herd? Not just the herd out there, the herd in you. Are you going to do that? Or do you realize that that's a waste of time to do something like this? What you've got to do is find your own specific zone and go to where you've got, as it amounts to, your own brain cells, your own molecules that are off thinking these horrendously exciting. Some of them may be insane. You know, how many weird thoughts do you think Newton had before he came up with inventing the fig? But are you going to track? Are you going to be interested in those isolated these thinkers, your own little thinkers, your own little inventors, of all reports as far as being a social line, they say that uh, Thomas Alva Edison left a lot. They say a lot to be desired. In other words, everything I ever heard, the man was intolerable. <laughs> but he didn't seem to care because all he did was stay in his little room and invent stuff. And if people didn't like him, his attitude seemed to be, you know, stuff them. If you noticed... In you, in your own brain, are you going to run with the herd? In you, not just out here, because it's in here too. You don't need to be staying around with a herd of people of your same race or your same religion or your same sex or your same anything. A whole group of people that they all hear the same knock. It's in you. It's the old established areas. It is at the very worst case scenario in so far as being a kind of neural subversive a real revolutionist you are back in the eastern zone at the very best can be said about it you're up here in the illusion of the middle class yes i'm doing something and you wait for at least a few people of your sort perhaps to go yeah yeah did you hear what i just thought and they go yeah and you go huh that's the very best case scenario the other one is whether you are trailing whether you are working on, whether you are in your own case, in the area of the guys, the cells, the brain molecules working in isolation, off by themselves, inventing, theorizing, plotting, planning. There is a old quote that I guess Nowadays, you could turn it into having judicial and philosophical significance if it had any, but it went something like this, that, um, that crimes committed by two will be paid for by one, will be paid for one by one. That is, you can be part of some conspiracy or an actual execution of some crime. You and two people, let's say, more than one. But if you get caught, and justice has its way, you're going to pay. Maybe the other people will too, but the point is, a crime can be done by two, but as far as you, the individual, is concerned, it's going to be paid for by one. To wit, you. Can you see that that is a, another way of putting that is, I didn't want to think that. They made me do it. The other participant made me do that. I would never have done this crime by myself. That may be. That's inherent, if you didn't notice, in the original quote that crimes can be done two by two, four by four, eight by eight, a hundred by a hundred. But the crime will be paid for one by one. So you can say, well, I've never done the crime. 
had it not been for them. That may exactly be the truth, that you would have never done it. Never, 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 never had it not been for them. Now forget crimes. Thinking. The affecting chemical changes happening in your own brain. Are you going to follow the herd changes? Are you going to follow the natural changes? Are you going to find, follow what amounts to a chemical crime in you? And so, well, I didn't want to think that. I didn't want to keep doing this over and over and over. That may be, but you're going to pay for it one by one. My brain made me do it. May well be, but so what? You might as well go back and rethink my example of the French linguist comment that most of you still are scratching your head. They made me do it. Something made me want, something made me try and pronounce sang from or full, full pop. I tried my best. I, wanted, I did want to do it so right. And I was afraid some people here who had been perhaps better educated than me, perhaps have been, and more travels. And I knew that they would spot it. You can't win. That's still on the basis. You're saying, well, they made me try and pronounce it right. Instead of just going to him and pronounce it, you know, it looked like Fox Pass. And I call it fucking Fox Pass. You people on tape ignore that. <laughs> that is the F word, Fox. I shouldn't pretend that that slipped out. I did it. I'm going to look ashamed. We only got a few seconds. I'm going to spend it looking ashamed. <laughs> because they inform me that these things still may make it on some sort of TV showing. And I'm not supposed to say those words. And I knew it. But I wanted to make such a nice finish because, well, I've been hoping that I might be able to use these tapings as a springboard. I was, well, I might as well say it to further my career. The only question being is, what career is that? The real question is, why is life telling me all this stuff? But other than that, don't worry about it out there on tape. Sleep tight.